Will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O God, our strength and our living and loving redeemer. Amen. This past Thursday, uh, it was the final Thursday of the month, so we are going to have our kind of regular men's gathering uh, at, at, at Waltz. But then I saw on Facebook that Waltz was closing early on Thursday. Uh, so we called an audible, and we just I lit a fire in the backyard, and we had uh, some people over, some good fellowship. And then at the end, you know, the, the fire is dying down, and I had some things to do inside. And I just kind of left the fire sitting there on the patio. I mean, just just the embers, uh, and went and kind of did some dishes, keeping an eye on the fire. But I have to admit, there was a part of me that did feel a little bit guilty in leaving those embers sitting there, because there's that Boy Scout part of my brain, you know, that says you don't walk away from a fire, no matter how out you think it might be, you don't just kind of knock out the flame, you drench that thing and tell us this sludgy mess, and what out, but again, it was in the backyard. The hot, no, this is not a, and my house burned down story. Uh, no, everything was fine. Before I went to bed, I made sure that it was completely and totally out. But embers can be dangerous. There's no uh, shortage of forest fires that have been started by people who thought their fire was completely out when they walked away, and then something happened, and then those embers turned into a raging forest fire. Embers can be dangerous but they can also bring hope. If you've ever tried lighting a fire without matches, you know that there is a big difference between no ember and an ember. And if you're doing the thing that I had to do in Boy Scouts where you've got the stick and the string and you're trying to get something heated up and when you finally get it, you get excited because at one point there was nothing. Then at another point, there's an ember. And you can begin to blow on it and fan it into flame. And that little ember can become the fire you were intending to make. Well, why do I bring that up? Well, because Paul encourages Timothy and, and he uses similar imagery. This is Paul's second letter that he writes to Timothy. Timothy was kind of Paul's young protege. Uh, he refers to, Paul refers to Timothy as his beloved child as his son, that he is this father figure to him. But Timothy is discouraged. There are a number of reasons for this. First of all, ministry is difficult. Things don't always go your way. And, and when you're young Timothy and, and you are a part of this culture where, where people look down on people maybe who are younger than you are, who are you to tell me what to do? It can be discouraging. Or when false teachers come into the church and preach a gospel that is contrary to the gospel that Paul delivered to them, that, that Timothy continued to teach to them. And there begin to be these factions in the church. Also, at this same time, Paul is writing from prison. He's in jail. This is likely one of Paul's last letters that he wrote before he was put to death. So you can imagine the difficulty of trying to proclaim this gospel about a guy named Jesus who was crucified. And by the way, my authority comes from this guy, Paul, who came to speak to you. Where's Paul? Oh, well, well he's in prison right now. You're getting ready to be executed. But trust me, that, that gives me standing, right? It's easy to see that he could be discouraged. But Paul says to you, and I remember your tears. I long to see you, that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother and your mother, Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you. He's saying that there is this sincere faith there. And if there is that faith there, that is a whole lot. It, it, and I like that we had this in conjunction with our gospel lesson, where Jesus talks about temptations to sin. And, and how we deal with our brothers. And if we find a brother who is, has fallen into sin, we rebuke them. We say, hey, what you're doing, that's not good. But if they repent, we forgive them. If they sin seven times and come back seven times and, and they repent, we forgive. We always 
forgive. And what is the disciples, the apostles' response to this command to constantly forgive? Lord, increase my faith. Because it's not easy to forgive all the time. But Jesus said, if you have faith the size of a, of a mustard seed, you could tell this mulberry tree to uproot itself and plant itself in the sea, and it would obey you. Because Jesus is saying it's not a, a matter of the, the size of your faith. It's, is there faith? There is a difference between faith and no faith. Just like there is a difference between an ember and no ember. Paul says, I am sure that this faith dwells in you. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of hands. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Paul says to take that gift of faith, that, that, that seed, there, and fan it into flame. That'll go. Because God did not give you this spirit of timidity to say, woe is me. Sure hope this ministry thing goes okay. No. That we have confidence in our mission. Why? Because it's not about me, and it's not about my, my own self-confidence. It's based on what Christ has done, and we know that Christ has risen from the dead. Paul says he is not ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of him. He says, therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in the suffering of the gospel by the power of God. He saved us, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace. There's one uh, additional part of this that, that I really like, well, where Paul talks about guard, in the last verse he says, by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. And again, kind of going back to that analogy of a fire. If you've ever tried to get a fire going in a windy area, you know it's hard and you want to, you, you want to protect that flame, you want to guard it, or, or if it's raining, you want, you want to guard it so that nothing is able to put that fire out. Or if the acolyte happens to be walking too fast and their flame goes out, and they have to, fortunately that didn't happen today, uh, but wanting to guard that flame. Paul encourages Timothy to guard this good deposit. Don't let it be put out. Don't let it be taken away. But what is this good deposit that we are guarding? Because I think sometimes in the church, we begin to try to guard the wrong things. We look outside of our walls and we see the culture war going on, and we think we have to do everything we can to guard this. And this political issue, we need to guard that, and we need to fight against these things. And what gets lost in all of that, those things might be things that need addressing. But what is the thing that we guard? The gospel of Jesus Christ. That God sent his son Jesus to die for us. For all people. To forgive all of our sins and give us that free gift of salvation. We need to guard that. Because there are people who are coming in wanting to undermine that. Or wanting to add to that. Yes, God saved you, but you still need to. No, this is what we guard. And it can be difficult because we think that it's all on our shoulders. But Paul earlier talked about, which is why I suffered, but I am not ashamed for I know whom I have believed, uh, for I know whom I have believed and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day when he has entrusted it to me. I am not the one who preserves the church. We are not the ones who solely on our shoulders and our responsibility preserves and saves the church. I came across a, a story. I don't know if it's apocryphal or if it actually happened, but it fits in really well, so I'm going to tell it. Uh, it's about Napoleon. Short guy, you know, like to go off to war, you know, compensate for his height and whatnot. Well, Napoleon was no fan of the church. And it says, Napoleon Bonaparte once taunted a Catholic cardinal by threatening, Your Eminence, are you not aware that I have the power to destroy the church? To which the cardinal replied, Your Majesty, 
We clergy have done our best to destroy the church for the past 1,800 years. We have not succeeded, and neither will you. We, because of our, our, our sinfulness, our, our hypocrisy, our, our giving in to temptation, our just getting it wrong time and time again, we have done enough to, to, to damage the church. But Christ has given us the Spirit who calls, gathers, and enlightens the whole Christian church on earth and keeps it together. And in that Christian church, he daily gives us his gifts. The Lord has promised that he will preserve that church. We guard and protect the gospel because we want to share that gospel with others so that they too may know what God has done with them, that we would plant that seed of faith and that we would take that seed of faith, that ember, and we would be able to fan it into flame in them, that they are also able to pass the faith on to other people, that the gospel would go to all the ends of the earth. Amen. And now may the peace which passes all understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen.